Innistrad is a grim and dark world filled with untold horrors that lurk in the shadows beyond fortified towns and hunt humanity with malicious ardor. Spanning seven sets and with three visits to the plane, Innistrad's history is storied and complex, filled with valiant triumphs, horrible tragedies, and uniquely memorable characters. Today, we'll dispel the rumors and uncover the facts of Innistrad's dark history and fate. Hey lore lovers, my name's Eric with the Lorebrarians YouTube channel, and welcome to part 2 of the Plain of Innistrad Explained. In part 1, we explored the provinces of Innistrad in detail, learning about the peoples and cultures that populate them, as well as the struggle between day and night that forms the Plain's signature dichotomy. If you haven't already, be sure to check it out to better understand the foundation of Innistrad. I'll put a link in the description below. In part 2, we're going to trace the history of this cruel plain, from the birth of the provinces to the coming of Avacyn, through the battle against an extraplanar invasion, all the way to the events surrounding the current day of the plain. We'll also take a closer look at the stories and arcs of characters that have either visited Innistrad or currently call it home. But before we begin, I'm excited to announce the channel's giveaway is still live. We're approaching 20,000 subscribers. To show my support and give back to the community we've built here on the channel, I've partnered with Kenon Orhan at orhanwoodwork.com to create a stunning handcrafted deck box made from walnut and wenge accents. Featuring hand-cut dovetails, the box holds 300 standard sleeved cards, or anything else you'd like to store. All you have to do to be entered in the giveaway is make sure you're subscribed to the Librarian's channel and leave a comment in this video or my previous Finding Flavor Crimson Bow video with the hashtag giveaway. If you've already done so in the last video, no need to repeat here. The running will last through the month of November with the winner announced in December. And a big thanks to my Patreon supporters who are helping me grow and improve the channel. If you're interested in learning more and earning some perks like shoutouts and early access to videos, check out patreon.com slash the librarians. All right, time to dust off ancient tomes and scour the catacombs as we trace the history of Innistrad. Let's dive in. The story of Innistrad begins thousands of years before the current day. Precious few sources exist detailing the creation of Innistrad, but as the raw forces of nature and pulsing mana ley lines shaped the nascent plain, so too, born in this maelstrom, were the forces of darkness. Demons and the ancient ancestors of today's horrors coalesced from pure black mana, emerging from the huge chasm in Gaia Reach mountain range that would later be named the Ashmouth. Their angelic counterparts were born of white mana to combat the forces of evil and protect the sentient race of humanity that just began to stir from its embryonic cocoon. Four extremely powerful angels took form with the birth of the plane, becoming the archangel paragons over all other angels and protectors of humanity against terrible monsters. In addition to white, each sister is master over one other color of mana, and each represents a certain aspect of life or death on Innistrad. Sigarda, green and white aligned, becomes leader of the flight of herons, angels that represent birth and purity and protect the living from vile threats. Bruna, white and blue aligned, leads the flight of alabaster and heralds the blessed sleep, ferrying spirits of the dead to beautiful oblivion in the ether. Gisela, red and white aligned, represents flight gold knight. These angels represent the sun and dazzle their demonic foes in martial combat. Lisa, black and white aligned, takes charge of flight dusk, a most peculiar flight of angels that seeks to understand their enemies and learn from them to best protect humanity. Liesa and her angels often make deals with demons, learn from horrors and abominations, and ally themselves with witches, all for the greater good of humanity. Soon, humanity's cocoon breaks, and the first ancient peoples come pouring forth, most likely emanating from the region of modern-day Gavany. As humans erect villages, learn the rudiments of craft, and master the forces of nature, they begin developing entire communities. The Principality of Gavany is born, and from it, human settlers embark on the harrowing journey 
to populate the rest of Innistrad. In short order, settlers traversed the rugged Geyer Mountain peaks, fell trees in the dense Uvenwald, and chart a course on the foaming coastline to found hamlets and form the provinces of Stensia, Kessig, and Nephalia. Palisades are built, streets are cobbled, commerce flows freely, and creative invention takes hold, allowing the provinces of man to expand and reach a golden age. But on Innistrad, darkness is not far beyond the light. Despite their flourishing, all around, humans are preyed upon by demons, tempted and deceived by their whispers of power. Morbid alchemists and death wielders perfect the arts of necromancy and reanimate countless dead to terrorize the living. It's uncertain, but the curse of lycanthropy seems to be native to the plane, and the howl of werewolves likely emanated from deep within the Ulvenwald and beyond, gripping peasants with fear and forcing them to retreat into the safety of their villages. As the forces of light and dark reached equilibrium, we receive word of the first documented event in Innistrad's early history. In roughly negative 2430 AR, a deadly famine sweeps across the province of Stensia. The region has always been unforgiving, with farmers harvesting meager yields from the barren earth. But disease and increasingly unfavorable seasons strike the population hard. Soon, hundreds to thousands are dying by the month from starvation and the province teetered on the brink of annihilation. An eccentric and aging human alchemist named Edgar Markov had been obsessed with extending life. As famine swept the land, his experiments and endeavors to achieve immortality grew more pressing. If he could develop a way to exist without the need for food, to subsist on other materials, then he, his family, and many other Stensians would emerge from the famine victorious. Every attempt, however, led to failure. In his desperation, Edgar turned to dark magic and to the powers of demon kind. He was approached by a demon named Shilgengar, who convinced the alchemist to begin experimenting with blood magic and divulged a powerful ritual that would bestow immortality on its caster. The ritual required powerful blood, and so Markov hunted an angel, drained it of its lifeblood, and distilled it to create the demonic decoction. Edgar cast the ritual and imbibed the liquid, undergoing a horrible transformation that bestowed him with immortality and freedom from the need of food, but left him filled with an unquenchable thirst for human blood, becoming the first vampire on Innistrad. Markov saw the power and potential of vampirism. Not only would it save his family and others from famine, but the need to subsist on lifeblood would cull the population of Stensia, considerably reducing the demand for crops. With his daring solution, Markov gathered the most powerful nobles and illustrious families, proposing that they too embrace the blessed curse of vampirism. This event is showcased in the Art of the Card Blood Tribute, where the Voldaren, Stromker, Markov, Falkenrath, and other families have gathered to partake in Edgar's ritual. On bent knee, we see Edgar's grandson Soren Markov, anointed by the ritual. The horrifying transformation causes much trauma for Soren, and as it courses through his body, it unlocks something deep within. The curse of vampirism ignites Markov's latent spark. He ascends to the status of Planeswalker, and is cast into the unknown of the Blind Eternities. We hear little of Innistrad for many ages after the birth of the Vampire Bloodlines, but Soren Markov travels across the plains to seek arcane knowledge and satisfy his dark pleasures. Nearly 1,000 years after his ascension, Soren befriends and acts as benevolent mentor to Nahiri, a young core planeswalker and lithomancer from the plain of Zendikar. The two grow close in their travels through the multiverse, and in roughly negative 1440 AR, stumble upon a terrible sight. The destruction of a plane by three enormous, interdimensional beings known as the Eldrazi Titans. The Eldrazi are creatures of the blind eternities that feed on the mana of planes, extending their hungry maws into the physical realm and absorbing all they can before the plane collapses. Realizing the threat these beings pose to their own worlds and countless others, 
Soren and Nahiri ally themselves with the elder dragon planeswalker Ugin, who had been observing the Eldrazi for countless years. The trio decide to lure the Titans to Nahiri's home plane of Zendikar, rich with vibrant and powerful mana ley lines, and trap them in stasis using Ugin's draconic magic and Nahiri's hedron network. Their plan bears fruit, and the planeswalkers successfully trap Ulamog, Kozilek, and Emrakul in a dormant state. Sealed at the Eye of Ugin, the trio make a binding pact that should the Eldrazi break free of their chains, the planeswalkers will return to reinforce the fetters. This pact and Soren's relationship with Nahiri will have considerable repercussions for both the planeswalkers and their home worlds for centuries to come. While Soren travels the blind eternities, Innistrad grows more and more dangerous for the struggling race of humans. At this point in time, the four provinces of Gavany, Stensia, Nephelia, and Kessig have been established in fortifications built around the largest cities. But beyond the guarded parapets and warm glow of lantern light, the humans of Innistrad are relentlessly hunted by the horrors lurking in the shadows. The four noble vampire families of Markov, Stromkirk, Falkenrath, and Voldaren strengthen their positions, grow their ranks, and constantly prey upon humanity. Over the decades, the division between the vampires and the humans from which they descended stretches wider. With increased strength, stamina, longevity, the vampires of Innistrad completely dominate the province of Stensia, and some go as far as Gavany or Nephalia. They erect great manors and large palatial estates to satisfy their vanity and demonstrate their superiority. With vampire attacks increasing and humanity already embattled with the demons, werewolves, and untold monsters of the plane, their cities crumble, once great bastions of light snuffed out by the encroaching darkness. Human populations dwindle with alarming speed as the self-indulgence and decadence of the vampiric bloodlines grow. In dire straits and facing potential extinction, the humans of Innistrad turn to old magic and older gods for a promise of hope. Though we have no accounts to verify the certainty, it's likely during this time that the worship of Grindanu began, and with it the practice of celebrating the Harvest Tide Festival. We first hear of Grindanu from Catilda in the set of Midnight Hunt, an entity that seems to be a god of renewal, nature, and hope. Harvest Tide, a festival of light and rejuvenation, is meant to give thanks to Grindanu for its protection and to celebrate living another year on the Grim Plain. The ancient artifact known as the Celestis may also have been built around this time, a device capable of balancing the cycle of day and night and ensuring humanity's light would not be snuffed by eternal dark. But Grindanu isn't the only god worshipped in this time. Runo, the eccentric progenitor of the Stromkirk vampire bloodline, takes up residence in the coastal province of Nephalia, where he becomes enamored with the ocean, its beauty, its power, and its infinite wisdom. In the flavor text of Awoken Horror, we hear Runo's dedication to the sea and its god. It serves as evidence of the ancient power of the deep, a reminder that the sea is the only thing worthy of reverence. That ancient power stirs below the foaming surf, a terrible force known as Krothus, Lord of the Deep, to whom Runo and his cult give thanks. For many centuries, Innistrad continues on this path, humanity falling on all sides to the depredation of monsters, vampires gorging themselves on the lesser species, wolf packs hunting in the night, and what few angels exist, trying in vain to protect the light. The most pivotal moment for Innistrad unfolds in the year 3840 AR, when Soren Markov returns from his multiversal travels to witness a plane on the brink of annihilation. His species doesn't see the relationship vampires have with humans. They need robust and growing human populations if they are to maintain their own numbers. The fate of the two races is inextricably linked, and a grim future awaits Innistrad's vampires if humanity dies out. The angelic flights aren't numerous enough to fight evil on all fronts, and the human settlements are ill-equipped to defend themselves against the unnatural aggression 
and raw power the monsters of Innistrad possess. To save humanity's future and that of his own kind, Soren creates a blessed protector, a brilliant and perfect embodiment of light, a stalwart champion and beacon of hope in a grim, unrelenting world. We hear his intentions in the flavor text of the card, Bloodflow Connoisseur, which states, Death not for survival, but for vanity and pleasure? This is the decadence I sought to curb. He creates an archangel with the power to defend humanity and force back the darkness, bestowing upon her the name of Avacyn and forever altering the fate of Innistrad. Avacyn unites with the four archangel sisters. Though they are much older, her powers are beyond the sisters, and Sigarda, Bruna, and Gisela vow their flights to her cause. Liesa, however, is beyond redemption. Avacyn is inflexible and zealous in her persecution of evil, and once she learns that Liesa consorted with a demon lord known as the Buried One, she declares all of Flight Dusk heretical, accomplices to the very monsters that prey on their human charge. Liesa's three sisters didn't join Avacyn in her crusade, but the Archangel required no assistance. She single-handedly eradicated Flight Dusk and wiped their very names from existence. After demonstrating her awesome potential, the Archangel assumes her responsibilities at once, and Avacyn courses through the skies of Innistrad, striking down demons, lifting curses, and curtailing lycanthropic and vampiric hunt packs. The presence of Avacyn renews faith within humanity and creates a new belief. No longer drawn to the shamanic superstitions of the Harvest Tide Festival or worship of the old gods, humanity creates instead the Church of Avacyn, from which their hope flows. Avacyn gathers the existing angels and coordinates them into efficient flights to protect the blessed or smite the wicked. Prelates and church leaders create knightly orders of Cathars and divine inquisitors to enact the angels' will and protect their dwindling settlements. As the forces of light strike back the encroaching dark, Soren creates an artifact to assist Avacyn with her purpose as plane-wide protector. He uses rudimentary knowledge and lithomancy gained from his travels with Nahiri to sculpt the Hell Vault, molding a large fragment of moon silver into a monolithic prison that traps beings too powerful to be destroyed, namely the demons of Innistrad. They are instead to be bound within the mystical Hell Vault a sentiment echoed in Avacyn's oath, which appears in the flavor text of Bonds of Faith and states, what cannot be destroyed will be bound. In the following decades, Avacyn, her flight of angels, and her church restore the balance and protect humanity against the lurking predators. For his efforts, Soren is marked a traitor to the vampires. Their hedonism and vanity blinded them to the bitter fate that awaited the race once humans were eradicated, and they view Soren's actions as a grievous betrayal worthy only of contempt. Shortly after Avacyn's creation, the lithomancer Nahiri planeswalks to Innistrad seeking Markov. It seems he's become a traitor to more than just his bloodline. In a frenzy, Nahiri berates Soren for leaving her plea unanswered. The Eldrazi had wrested free of their chains and unleashed their spawn on Zendikar once more. In her moment of need, Nahiri invoked their old pact and called to Ugin and Soren for assistance, but neither appeared. Though she reinforced their prison on her own, Nahiri searched for Soren, worried as to why he didn't show, only to find him alive and unharmed on his home plane. Furious, Nahiri accuses Soren of endangering Zendikar and threatens Innistrad. Though Soren states the Hell Vault was responsible for interfering with her interplanar beacon, the Lithomancer refuses to listen and moves to action. Avacyn, protector of Innistrad, senses the threat Nahiri poses to the plane, and so intercepts the Lithomancer. In a flash, the two come to blows, but the fight is swiftly ended when Soren overpowers the Lithomancer and banishes Nahiri into the Hell Vault, imprisoning her in stasis. For nearly 1,000 years, Avacyn and her angelic host 
bolster humanity's faith and push back the darkness on Innistrad. With holy invocations and the power of moon silver, she and her flight trapped dozens if not hundreds of demonic beings within the mystical hell vault, cleansing much of the area around the Ashmouth. The moon silver collars that Avacyn and her angels used to bind demons and other abominations for transport to the hell vault takes on special meaning for humanity and becomes the symbol of the church. Their endeavors instilled a sense of duty and honor within humans, who also took up sword and silver in the fight against demons. The Church of Avacyn grows into the leading religious, political, and military institution headquartered in the high city of Thraben in the province of Gavany. From here, the will of Avacyn is made known and word spread to the furthest villages along even the most isolated causeways. The ranks of the knightly orders of Cathars grows, their famed riders and the brutally efficient inquisitors of the church hunt down vampires, werewolves, and all manner of predators lurking both beyond and within city walls. The most famous being the knight turned saint named Traft. Traft was renowned for his legendary skill in combat against unnatural threats, and although he couldn't destroy a demon's essence permanently, he repeatedly slayed them and thwarted their plans to poison the minds of humans. So great were his abilities that Traft was trusted and assisted by the warrior seraphs of Avacyn. But shortly after his 40th year, the saint was lured and tricked into slaughtering several people in a ritual for the demon lord Withengar, who proceeded to kill the remarkable demon slayer. Traft's body was no more, but his spirit refused to pass on to the blessed sleep, intent on completing his mission to eradicate demon kind. After imprisoning the most vile and powerful demons, Avacyn turns her attention towards other creatures hunting humanity. For many years, the angelic host tracks down and slays vampiric night stalkers, werewolf howl packs, and undead legions. No longer pushed to the brink, no longer forced to live out meager existence, no longer in a struggle for mere survival. The humans of Innistrad experience a budding resurgence, benevolently guided by the watchful eyes of Avacyn. The Golden Age of Humanity lasts several centuries, but in roughly 4557 AR, it passes into a dangerous and terrible twilight. Though much of demon kind is shackled within the binding powers of the Hell Vault, the most ruthless and cunning of all demon lords remains a present threat, the treacherous Grizzlebrand. For decades, Avacyn has tried and failed to incarcerate him. For decades, he has tried and failed to poison her soul or slay her. Finally, he emerges from the shadows at the base of the Hell Vault and shouts a roar of challenge to Avacyn directly. For four days, the rivals clash, engaged in an epic and brutal battle, witnessed only by an angelic host and the leader of Avacyn's church, Machaeus the Lunarch with a contingent of his most trusted bishops. At first, the two are equal, and neither the angel nor the demon can gain the advantage. Spear and claw clash, and powerful spells are cast. Finally, on the fourth day, Avacyn sees an opening. She puts all of her might into a desperate lunge and thrusts her moonsilver spear into Grizzlebrand's body, pushing him towards the Hell Vault. But the demon won't go quietly, and he won't go alone. Just as the vault opens to absorb his essence, Grizzlebrand impales Avacyn with his sharp claw. Locked as they are, both are pulled into the magical prison. Avacyn, defender of humanity and savior of Innistrad, has been defeated. Her fate is known only to Micaeus and his prelates, who refuse to divulge the truth for fear of the hysteria it will cause. These events set the stage for the story of the Innistrad block. Avacyn's absence is immediately felt across the plain. As a source of divine faith and holy retribution, blessings or prayers made in Avacyn's name were imbued with magical strength to withstand evils. Now that she's missing, the holy wards that once protected hamlets and city palisades weaken. Prayers on the lips of pilgrims and parishioners go unanswered, and Innistrad slinks once more into a nightmare world of despair. 
the vampires and werewolves that were so zealously hunted grow more ambitious and less fearful. The persecuted stitchers and ghoul callers, whose creations were cleansed with holy fire, once more begin raising scores of undead. Demons, who had for so long been thought of as a myth among most villagers, stir from the ash mouth to prey on the living. The holy orders of night Cathars are stretched thin to protect settlements against increasing attacks, but their most valuable weapon in their struggle has been taken from them. Without Avacyn, their faith has no vessel or source. The holy protection her name invoked is broken, and even the angels of Innistrad lose hope during the sudden dark ascension as seen in the arts and flavor text of Requiem Angel, which shows a member of the host despondent at the foot of a holy statue and reads, When angels despair, what hope can remain for mortals? Within this dark world, no human settlement is safe from the depredations of monsters, as is highlighted by the destruction of Averbrook. The city of Averbrook was strategically situated between two major causeways and acted as the provincial seat of Keswick, a budding cosmopolitan area at the edge of the Ulvenwald. As its defenses weakened, the city was attacked from the inside and out by werewolves of the vicious Mandronin Howl Pack. For days, the streets ran red with blood as werewolves slaughtered villagers in droves. After the bloodshed, the Mandronin enacted a blood ritual that unleashed a mystical concussive force, leveling the city. The destroyed town of Averbrook became known as Hollowhenge, a place to be avoided by the living. All across Innistrad, other human communities share the same fate as Averbrook. Despite their anguish, Micaeus remains resolute in maintaining the secret of Avacyn's whereabouts. He charges Lothar, Cathar and Guardian of Thraben, with the defense of the Hell Vault. Under no circumstances can it be destroyed or captured. To assist with his mission, Lothar seeks the young but charismatic and valiant Cathar Thalia to act as his second. Thalia earned her reputation as a selfless warrior early in her career when she defeated an entire Howl Pack to save the life of one man. Together, the two bolster the High City's defenses and remain vigilant in their watch, for word quickly reaches them of an unrelenting and dark force marching on Thraben. The insane necromantic siblings Gisa and Garolf Sakani are a master ghoul caller and stitcher respectively. They are also highly competitive and continually seek to best one another in their pursuit of the perfect undead. Gisa prefers the immediate and mass reanimation of the dead, while Garolf loves the meticulous craft of the stitcher, perfecting his creations through patience and ingenuity. Their rivalry led to many conflicts between undead and even several attacks on human settlements across the moorlands. Sir Audric, commander of the Gavany Riders, leads intrepid bands of night Cathars on several crusades against the undead abominations and other creatures of the night that threaten the fringes of Gavany's borders. The two siblings momentarily enter a truce when Garolf offers Gisa the opportunity to join him in a grand attack, one far greater than anything they've done before. The pair agree to turn their combined undead hordes on the city of Thraben, jewel of the church and source of hope. But before their assault begins, Garolf sneaks into the city undetected, makes his way to the Lunark's chambers, and murders Micaeus in the dark of night. The true whereabouts of Avacyn die with the Lunark's final breath. Shortly after, shouts of alarm pierce the quiet and torches light up the night as Thraben's watchers see a massive horde of undead abominations shamble towards the city, led by Gisa. Moans of the dead and dying fill the streets, steel finds rotten flesh, and much blood is spilled as droves of relentless zombies pour over Thraben's defenses. At once, Thalia and Lothar coordinate detachments of Cathars to bolster the city and attempt to drive back the forces of evil. But confusion and pandemonium quickly spread as the siege of Thraben reaches its height. We can see the undead army in the Art of the Card zombie apocalypse, where scores of accursed have breached the gates and are pouring into the streets. With the high city on the brink of destruction, 
and desperation sinking in. Thalia and other Cathars ignite much of the city's streets in a brilliant inferno. They use the fire to drive back Gisa and Geralt's armies, burning hundreds of zombies and retaking the city. The stench of rotten flesh fills Thraben and scores of Cathars lie dead, including Lothar. But the high city still stands. For her efforts and her resolve, Thalia assumes the mantle of Guardian of Thraben and is charged with protecting the Hell Vault with her life. She has no idea how quickly that duty will be tested. The necromancer and planeswalker Liliana Vess made a pact with four demons, trading her soul for power and youth. But with the acquisition of the magical artifact known as the Chain Veil, Liliana is powerful enough to challenge her demons directly and win back her soul. She planeswalks to Innistrad seeking one of her demon creditors, the demon Lord Grizzlebrand, who's currently imprisoned in the Hell Vault. Liliana arrives on the Dark World in search of Grizzlebrand, but her hunt bears little fruit. She isn't, however, the only planeswalker hunting on Innistrad. Liliana has been tracked herself by Garrick Wildspeaker, who had been cursed by the Chain Veil during their confrontation on Chandelar. His body and mind are corrupted, and his nature magic is tainted by death and decay. Enraged, the Huntsman corners Liliana in the grafts of Nephalia, but he soon realizes his mistake. Although Garrick overpowers her, Nephalia is host to more corpses and remains than any other province on Innistrad, and the Necromancer quickly summons an army to thwart Garrick's advances and allow her to retreat. Their skirmish is depicted in the art and flavor texts of the cards Triumph of Ferocity and Triumph of Cruelty. Following rumors of Grizzlebrand's whereabouts, Liliana travels to the high city of Thraben, home of the Lunark and church leader Micaeus, who's said to possess knowledge of the demon's fate. Vess comes upon the smoldering and raised streets of Thraben, just on the mend after successfully driving off the siege. She journeys to the Lunark's chambers, only to find him dead, slain by Garolf. But death is not an end to service or to answers for Liliana, and she proceeds to resurrect the Lunark, seen in the card Micaeus the Unhallowed. She presses the undead for answers and learns that Grizzlebrand is trapped, along with countless other demons, within the silver monolith known as the Hell Vault. Two obstacles stand in her way. First is Thalia and her Cathars who stand guard over the Hell Vault with their very lives. Second, the magic of the Hell Vault and the nature of silver on Innistrad prevent Liliana's black magic from destroying it directly and breaking her demon creditor free. So Vess devises a method to indirectly assault the monolithic prison. Liliana calls on the Chain Veil's power, wraps the Hell Vault in a sinister enchantment spell, then binds it to Thalia. The spell forces an unholy choice upon Thalia. She can either destroy the Hell Vault, releasing the untold demonic horrors trapped within, or she can sit and watch her entire battalion of soldiers breathe their last as Liliana's ghouls and the dark spell kill all under her leadership. Thalia disavows her duty and chooses to save her soldiers. In a brilliant flash of light and raw power, the Hell Vault breaks, its silver fragments shattering into thousands of pieces. Demons pour forth from their prison, and once more their vile presence is unleashed upon Innistrad. But unknown to Thalia, and even to Liliana, the Hell Vault's destruction also brings the freedom of Innistrad's angelic protector. The events are related to us in the flavor text of Avacyn, Angel of Hope. A golden helix streaked skyward from the Hell Vault. A thunderous explosion shattered the silver monolith, and Avacyn emerged, free from her prison at last. As suddenly as her disappearance weakened the protective wards of the plane, Avacyn's emergence from the Hell Vault acts as a holy surge that washes over all of Innistrad. In a flash, the tide turns as light is strengthened to once again beat back the darkness. Avacyn's restoration lifts the spirits of both humans and angels, 
as they witness their valiant protector soar through the skies and bring justice to the vile. Avicen and her angelic hosts first order is to hunt down the demons that escaped from their prison. Next, Avicen uses her strength to enact the curse mute, a wave of mystical energy that halts or severely weakens the dark curses gripping Innistrad. We see this in the art and flavor text of Reforge the Soul, where a blazing soul is purified. It reads, in a wave of spells called the curse mute, Avicen cleansed the world with divine fire. Though the curse mute couldn't completely reverse the nature of lycanthropy, many of the plains werewolves were freed from their carnal desires and blessed with a higher purpose. They transform into wolfir, which we can see in the card Joint Assault. Avicen's curse mute decree states, By my power, werewolves shall become the wolfir, our allies in combat against darkness. While angels and humans wage war on the creatures of night, Liliana hunts Grizzlebrand with relentless ardor. Finally, she corners the demon, and as she prepares her killing blow, Grizzlebrand makes one last, desperate play to save his life. The demon tempts her with promises of power, of wealth, of fulfilled ambitions. Liliana calls upon her own powers, and with the strength of the chain veil coursing through her, Bess obliterates the demon. Grizzlebrand's essence is no more. Elsewhere, humanity continues to push back the darkness, led by Thalia and by the master tactician Audric. With martial cunning and a blessed sword, Audric and his soldiers cut through waves of zombies, impaled dozens of vampires, and harassed dwindling werewolf packs. After what seems like an endless twilight for the people of Innistrad, the break of day is once more on the horizon. Their valiant protector and source of holy power has been restored. The monsters cower in fear and return to hiding, and belief is once more coursing through their hearts. But the destruction of the Hell Vault released another force on the plane, one more powerful than Avacyn and more sinister than Grizzlebrand, a force that will stop at nothing to bring pain and destruction to the plane to Soren Markov's homeworld. The Hell Vault also releases Nahiri, the core lithomancer and planeswalker from Zendikar, whom Soren banished into the prison for 1,000 years. After quickly returning to her world and witnessing the destruction brought upon Zendikar by the release of the Eldrazi Titans, Nahiri vows vengeance upon Soren. Just as he allowed desolation to grip her cherished Zendikar, so too would she bring it to Innistrad. Twisted by rage and anger, Nahiri immediately prepares her vengeance that will bring great suffering to Sorin and shake Innistrad to its very foundations. Although the Defender of Humanity has once more returned to the skies, there's a different aura surrounding Archangel Avacyn. She quickly grows more zealous in her crusade against evil, more suspicious of her human flock's own innocence, and more erratic in her behaviors. But it's not just Avacyn. Her angelic host and many other creatures on Innistrad are changing in mind and body. The horrors of night are mutating, transforming into more grotesque beings with multiple appendages and mouths. Even Avacyn's collar, symbol of the church and divinity, has become twisted. Paranoia grips humanity. We see the madness of the angels and the xenophobic nature of the church in the formation of the Lunark Inquisition. These are on display in cards such as Always Watching, which depicts a twisted host of angels harshly scrutinizing humans, and on the flip side of Avicinian missionaries, which shows Lunark Inquisitors zealously persecuting traitors within their ranks. Disillusioned by what the church has become and realizing that their famed institution has been infiltrated by Skirstag cultists, seen in the flavor text of Skirstag Supplicant, Thalia becomes branded a heretic and instead establishes the Order of St. Traft, to which Audric and countless other Cathars pledge their allegiance. Surrounding these new developments is the appearance of mysterious cryptoliths that dot the landscape. These twisted rock formations are erected all across Innistrad and are of unknown origin. 
piquing the interest of planeswalker Tamiyo, a Soratami moonfolk from Kamigawa that traveled to Innistrad to study the powers of its moon. Tamiyo researches the cryptolith structures, believing they might be responsible for the transformations and madness befalling Innistrad. Though the moonfolk frequently disappears into the wilderness for days to weeks, Tamiyo leaves behind her revelations and clues bound in her journal. Meanwhile, Nahiri returns to Markov Manor, seething with hatred and seeking to enact retribution against Soren. Though Soren is away, she unleashes her lithomancy on the unsuspecting vampires, utterly obliterating House Markov and decimating its ranks. We see her handicraft on display in the art of the card foreboding ruins, where the fractured remnants of Markov Manor lie suspended in air, fueled by Nahiri's magic. Amidst the fear and pandemonium surging across Innistrad, Jace Bellerin travels to the plane in search of Soren Markov. He's pursued by a pack of werewolves upon his arrival, but Liliana Vess, who has residence on Innistrad, defeats the Hal Pack and offers her hospitality to the beleaguered traveler. Jace relates the events of Battle for Zendikar to Liliana. The three Eldrazi Titans emerge from their slumber to wreak havoc upon the plane, but the newly formed League of Planeswalkers known as the Gatewatch were able to defeat Ulamog and Kozilek with the help of the plane's natives. Unfortunately, Emrakul, the most powerful of the Titans, escaped and hasn't been seen since. Jace is seeking Soren, one of the planeswalkers that originally imprisoned the Eldrazi, to assist in tracking down and neutralizing Emrakul. Bellerin sets out on the trail to find Soren and to uncover the mystery of Innistrad's madness, which takes him to the ruins of Markov Manor. The fallout of Nahiri's attack is still fresh, and although Jace doesn't locate Soren, he finds Tamiyo's journal amidst the death and destruction. The journal speaks of the cryptoliths and how they are directing the flow of mana ley lines to a particular location for use in a massive spell. Jace follows the clues in the journal, the trail of the cryptoliths, and the accounts of a mentally broken and raving woman, which all lead him to the Drownyard Temple off the coast of Nephalia. His own mind is attacked as Jace approaches the focal point of the cryptoliths. He sees illusions of himself and hears otherworldly whispers. Below, hordes of undead zombies mill about the cryptoliths. Human cultists and twisted worshippers say prayers, and even a host of angels is present to sing of salvation. Tamiyo's journal indicates that the purpose of the temple is to relocate a large celestial object in the skies, and Jace has a suspicion that Liliana is responsible. The voices in his head affirm his thoughts, and now completely under the maddening influence of the cryptoliths, Jace returns to Vess's manor and confronts her. The Chain Veil and the Raven Man protect Liliana from his assaults, and she brings Jace to his senses momentarily, highlighted in the art and flavor text of Liliana's indignation, which reads, Days ago, you came to my door asking for help, Jace. Yet now here you are with accusations? Still without answers as to the purpose of the Cryptolis and the madness that grips Innistrad, Jace travels to Thraben to confront Avacyn directly. There, he meets Tamiyo, who uses her powers to completely free Jace of his madness. He submits that Avacyn is corrupted, it's her infecting and twisting the plane, and the only way to cure Innistrad is to destroy the Archangel. Tamiyo is reluctant, due to the unforeseeable consequences it could have on Innistrad. Avacyn's mere existence wards the plane from threats, both across the plane and beyond the blind eternities, and her death may unleash untold evils. They aren't given much time to debate, as a maddened Avacyn crashes through the glass and brings the fight to them. Meanwhile, Sorn returns to Innistrad and realizes the gravity of his mistake in his dealings with Nahiri. He enters his family's manor witness to the violent retribution the Lithomancer enacted upon his kind, seen in the art and flavor text of Declaration in Stone. Within the ruins of the Markov estate, Sorn is moved to strike back against the Lithomancer. 
To this end, he travels to the estates of Olivia Voldaren and seeks her aid in mobilizing a vampire army to strike at Nahiri. Soren, however, has little standing within vampire society after being cast out for creating Avicen. Olivia will agree to lend aid only if Markov destroys his creation. Soren reluctantly agrees, and in the cards Call the Bloodline and Campaign of Vengeance, we see vampiric armies mobilized for war. Their respective flavor texts read, At Soren's appeal, Olivia Voldaren summoned the full might of her bloodline to gather at Lurin Brown Fortress. And, There is no saving this world, not anymore, but we shall be its bloody vengeance. Soren fulfills his promise and intercepts Avacyn in Thraben Cathedral as the Archangel attacks Jason Tamio. In her madness, Avacyn doesn't recognize Soren as her creator and launches several magical attacks at the vampire, which all harmlessly fizzle out. When Soren again affirms himself to be Avacyn's creator, the madness gripping her mind withdraws and the angel has a moment of lucidity. All of the twisted deeds and brutal massacres of innocence she's executed come flooding to her, and she realizes what she's become. She throws her anguish at Soren. If he was Avacyn's creator, then he was responsible for the flaw in her design that allowed the Archangel's mind to be infiltrated and corrupted. He was the greatest threat to Innistrad. Avacyn calls forth a host of angels from her flight moon silver to do battle with Soren. The ancient planeswalker dispatches the winged assault and sends a wounded Avacyn crashing down into the vault of the Archangel, the exact spot he had created her. Soren tries to reason with Avacyn, with his beautiful daughter, stating that he can heal her and cleanse her mind. But Avacyn is beyond saving. She states that if she isn't the daughter he had wanted, they would battle again and again because she would not yield to a monster. Truly heartbroken for what he must go through with, Sorn begins to unravel the spell he wove over a thousand years ago and cast Avacyn into oblivion. This event is brilliantly highlighted in the ardent flavor text of Anguished Unmaking, where we see Sorn undo his creation. The text reads, Sorn had created Avacyn, so it was a cruelty beyond imagining, a pain beyond description that it fell upon him to end her forever. Reeling from the crushing decision, Soren realizes this was all to Nahiri's orchestration, for with the disruption of Avacyn's protective magic, Innistrad is no longer safe from interplanar threats. The mysterious cryptoliths, the increasing madness of the plane, the transformation of many inhabitants, all are due to the Lithomancer's machinations. Nahiri, erected the lifts to pull the mana of Innistrad into an attractive bait to lure a true creature of nightmares. The last of the three Eldrazi titans released on Zendikar, Nahiri exacts her vengeance upon Sorin by unleashing the devastation of Emrakul. The illustration and flavor text of Coax from the Blind Eternities succinctly states the horror that is unleashed. At Nahiri's call, Emrakul traversed the vast emptiness between the plains and arrived on Innistrad. The Eldrazi Titan bursts forth from the Drownyard Temple and descends upon the high city of Thraben. Emrakul, the promised end, arrives on the plain and desolation will follow. At once, Innistrad is plunged into an eldritch nightmare as Emrakul's corrupting presence spawns thousands of reality-defying Eldrazi scions. Her influence also reaches Innistrad's denizens, as those with the weakest minds and souls have their bodies grotesquely mutated into Eldrazi abominations. All across Innistrad, humans, vampires, werewolves, and other creatures are quickly corrupted and transformed into Emrakul's spawn. We see this horrific attack in cards like Extricator of Flesh, where a Lunark Inquisitor has been transformed, and Abolisher of Bloodlines where a Voldaren vampire has been blessed with Emrakul's gift. Valiant Knight Cathar Thalia leads the intrepid Order of St. Traft in the organization of Thraben's defenses. She gathers uncorrupted humans and prepares barriers to hold off the relentless Eldrazi hordes. In the fight for survival, grudges and hatred are momentarily cast aside 
as Olivia Voldaren arrives to bolster Thraben's holdouts with an army of superhuman vampires. The High City of Thraben sees the most intense fighting as the forces of vampires and Order of St. Traft struggle against Nahiri, her cultists, and the Eldrazi hordes of Emrakul. High in the skies above the city, the once great archangels Bruna and Gisela have succumbed completely to the whispers of Emrakul, melding into one being known as Brizilla, an Eldrazi abomination. As fighting tears through the streets, Jace returns with the newly formed Gatewatch to bolster Thraben's defenses and once more fight to save a plane from the Eldrazi's consumption. The group attempts to contain Emrakul, using similar methods as they had done to Ulamog and Kozilek on Zendikar. Their plans bear little fruit, however, as Innistrad's mana ley lines were shifted and damaged by Nahiri's cryptoliths, and the plane itself doesn't respond to Nissa's attempts. The Gatewatch seeks smaller lines of mana with which to work, but they are beset on all sides by Nahiri's cultists and constantly harried by unrelenting Eldrazi hordes. The vampire lines falter, the Order of St. Traft takes heavy casualties, and the Gatewatch is beaten back. Desperation consumes the protectors of Innistrad as hopes of victory slip through their fingers. But something stirs on the horizon. Small specks begin to take shape as they progress towards Thraben. They are hundreds upon hundreds of undead, ghouls, scabs, and other zombies descending upon the beleaguered city. At the front stands Liliana Vess, dark savior of Thraben. Vess brings an undead army as relentless and unfeeling as the Eldrazi to save the city from their attacks. This is highlighted in the art of Liliana the Last Hope and Dark Salvation, whose flavor text reads, Countless ghouls surged through Thraben's streets, and with them came the city's salvation. Liliana's sudden reinforcement allows Innistrad's protectors to push the Eldrazi back. Zagarda, host of Herons and the last uncorrupted Archangel, arrives in Thraben to confront her mutated sisters. The flavor text of Brizilla reads, Upon discovering what had become of her sisters, Sigarda could only weep. There's no way for the Archangel to save Bruna and Gisela. The best Sigarda can do now is give them eternal rest. The Angel, assisted by Thalia, who has the spirit of St. Traft flowing through her, attacks the Eldrazi Abomination. Under St. Traft's protective aura, Thalia takes up Avacyn's spear and impales Brizilla slaying the sisters, which we can see in the art of the secret layer drop of Thalia, Guardian of Thraben. With the angel defeated, there remains only the looming threat of Emrakul. Jace Bellerin casts a mental aura around the Gatewatch to protect them from the Eldrazi's maddening presence. Calling upon the full power of the Chainveil artifact and her own considerable strength, Liliana launches salvos of death magic directly at the Titan. But Vess can't maintain such power for long, and quickly falls unconscious. As the members of the Gatewatch fight in desperation and seek a way to overcome Emrakul, Jace's mental barrier is pierced by the Eldrazi, who attempts to communicate telepathically with his own mind. An interplanar and multidimensional being is beyond the rational confines of a human brain, so Emrakul approaches Jace's mind in the form of the angel Emeria. Emrakul's facsimile is something Jace would never have believed, polite and conversational. In their discussion, the angel states, there should be blossoms, not barren resentment. The soil was not receptive. It's not my time, not yet. There's little way to determine what exactly the Eldrazi is communicating, but it seems Emrakul realizes that Innistrad is not ready for her gifts, for her presence and there is no way at all to determine when her time will come. After their bizarre conversation within his mind, Jace melds the thoughts of the Gatewatch and coordinates their efforts to imprison the Eldrazi Titan. Their attempt is unsuccessful, but then Tamiyo unfurls another of her lunar scrolls and gesticulates a powerful spell that when combined with Nissa's seal, whisks the Eldrazi Titan into Innistrad's mystical silver moon. In a flash, the war-torn Thraben falls silent, 
The remaining Eldrazi spawn wither away without their progenitor, and Emrakul's madness releases its grip on Innistrad's denizens. Liliana Vess wakes, her resentment of the Gatewatch all but dissipated. She's warmed by their camaraderie, by feeling needed. She realizes it would be good to have friends, especially to use as pawns to further her own ambitions. With self-interest in mind, Liliana takes her vows and joins the Gatewatch, seen in the art of Oath of Liliana, which reads, I'll keep watch. Happy now? The group of planeswalkers assess the once vibrant city when Tamio confides in Jace that she was overtaken by Emrakul's influence when they bound the Titan in the moon. The scroll seal she used wasn't the original she had intended, but rather one of Emrakul's choosing. The two are deeply unsettled by the prospects of the Eldrazi's future plans. As the Gatewatch protected Thraben, two other narratives unfold, the first of which surrounds the enigmatic planeswalker Davriel Kane. A diabolist and shadow mage, Kane has within him an extremely powerful and primal force known as a world soul entity that fuels his spells and protects him. Like Liliana, Davriel has had several dealings with demons and attempting to escape his past, he arrives on Innistrad just before Emrakul's influence grips the plane. Here, he discovers another world soul entity called the Bog Entity that exists within twin sisters Wilia and Takenda. Davriel and Takenda learn that Wilia is responsible for the recent attacks by a group of restless spirits and combine their efforts to defeat her, releasing her portion of the Bog Entity. Takenda draws on the power and the entity becomes complete within her, unleashing a torrent of magical power. Kane's own entity urges him to strike, to take the Bog and become even more powerful. Davriel refuses to be made a pawn of death and destruction and resists the urge, earning him the ire of his entity. Originally arriving on Innistrad for anonymity and isolation, the events around Davriel's manor estate brings him to the attention of a planeswalker cabal eager to recruit Kane to their cause. This group is ostensibly led by Kasmina, who is gathering walkers to prepare for a threat that could consume the entire multiverse. The second narrative concerns the bitter hatred and resentment between Nahiri the Lithomancer and her old colleague Soren Markov. Soren returns to Markov Manor seeking Nahiri. He believes his home is beyond saving, but not beyond avenging, and the two come to blows within his ancestral estates. The ancient planeswalkers, once close friends who shared a bond of mentorship, have fallen to bitter enemies that won't rest until one of them is no longer. Though Soren gravely wounds Nahiri, she bests him and traps the vampire within a stone prison, one with constantly rotating spikes that inflict enough pain to prevent concentration necessary for Soren to planeswalk away. Satisfied with her retribution, Nahiri leaves the devastated Innistrad to its own devices. Olivia Voldaren approaches Markov and mocks his weakness and defeat. He's no longer worthy of the mantle, Lord of Innistrad. She takes his ancient fang blade, assumes his title of lord, and leaves Soren to languish. Though the Gatewatch and defenders of Innistrad are victorious, the fallout of what will be recorded in history as their travails cannot be denied. Avacyn, symbol of hope and supreme power of light, has been destroyed and her church institution is no longer. Holy wards and protective prayers have lost their power. Nearly all of the angelic host lies slain. Thousands of shambling undead pour through the smoldering streets of a Thraben that stands in ruins. Humanity has been shaken to its foundations and must deal with the trauma of the travails while venturing into a grim and bleak future. Although Emrakul has been imprisoned, her presence in the moon begins to change the cycle of day and night on Innistrad. Darkness rises and the powers of evil once more reach out to grip the plane. And it's now that we come to the present day of Innistrad, an Innistrad on the brink of collapse with light and hope flickering their final flares. In the aftermath of the travails, the period of time surrounding Avacyn's madness and Emrakul's Eldrazi invasion, the plane and its denizens aren't what they once were. The angels have disappeared from the skies, 
The days are growing shorter as night continues its relentless encroachment, and the bitter cold of winter wraps its fatal grip around farms, villages, and cities alike. Food runs scarce in the bizarre night cycle and powers Innistrad's monsters as they prey on helpless human populations. Townsfolk and entire villages are slaughtered by increasingly powerful werewolf howl packs and vampiric bloodlines. The sense of a changing plane and an evil rising is captured in the art and flavor texts of cards like Evolving Wilds and Unnatural Growth. Here, Catilda states, Stencia blazes with new heat, Nephalia's tides are chaotic, and everywhere this unnatural frost. The land is sending a warning. And a natural growth reads, With the cycles of day and night unspooled, the twisted sway of the moon only grew and grew. But a great many more desperately hold on to hope. After all, Innistrad's people are nothing if not resilient. Farmers and smiths reform the twisted symbols of the church. Masons and woodsmen rebuild parish halls and burned fields. People try to move on, to see the light, however dim, at the end of their long struggle. Which is what brings so many to the ancient and mysterious rituals of the Dawnheart Coven of Witches and Warlocks that unfold in the forests of Kessig. The Dawnheart have for centuries worshipped not the angel Avacyn, but the ancient deity known as Grindanu through ritual performance of a harvest tide festival. In the days of Avacyn, the Dawnheart were persecuted for heresy and witchcraft, forcing them to retreat into obscurity. But with the downfall of the church and subsequent rise of evil, people flock in droves to the rituals in hopes of bringing back the Innistrad that once was. It's in this desperate world that the planeswalker Arlen Kord finds herself. Just as the plane is struggling between its two halves of day and night, so too is Arlen fighting between her humanity's sense of purpose and her lycanthropic urges for the hunt and for freedom. As she battles internally, Arlen seeks to find answers for the shortening of days and the terrible frost that besets the plane, for the increasing brutality of the aggressive werewolf packs. While hunting in the woods, she is approached by Catilda, the Dawnheart Prime, who reveals that her coven has been preparing a ritual to reset the balance, to bring day back to its former glory and cast out the night through the Harvest Tide Festival. The coven and other worshippers are gathered deep in the forest within the ruins of a massive and ancient structure known as the Celestis. Catilda says in the days of old the magical Celestis was used to maintain balance on Innistrad and keep the dichotomy of day and night. But the artifact hasn't been used in centuries, not since the coming of Avacyn, which Catilda posits distracted humanity from the true gods and the old ways. At the center of the Celestis sits a basin that requires two objects, the sun gold lock and the moon silver key. Once these artifacts are combined and the ritual is performed, it will activate the Celestis, aligning its weathered and overgrown spheres, once more restoring the balance between day and night. Catilda reveals that the sun gold lock is already in her possession, but she requires the moon silver key. She charges Arlen with locating the lost artifact, a mission that could save humanity. The path ahead is daunting, perilous, and personal for Arlen. The increasing werewolf attacks mentioned in cards like Foul Play and Dire Strain Rampage are instigated by the leader of Arlen's old Mondronan Howl Pack, Tovalar, Dire Overlord. After Avacyn's curse mute, the Mondronan Pack was dissolved, but with the strengthening of Innistrad's lunar powers, the wolves of the old pack have joined forces with new lycanthropes, more vicious and blood crazed than most, to create the devastating Dire Strain Howl Pack with Tovalar as Alpha. Arlen approaches him in the woods and sees his gathering forces. The Alpha attempts to bring her back into the fold. He tells her that she can deny her true identity, her true passions for only so long. He knows deep within that she is an uncaged spirit, a werewolf unbound. He urges her to join the Dire Pack and remain with her kind in the upcoming slaughter, for his wolves are planning to feast on the humans gathered at the Celestis for harvest time. Although Arlen refuses Tovalar's request, her own wolf pack can't resist the hunt. 
they join the ranks of the Dire Pack and submit to his Alpha authority. This kindred betrayal of trust and crossing of loyalties is displayed in the story spotlight card Pack's Betrayal, where we see a distraught Cord abandoned by her wolves. Once more alone and with time slipping from her grasp, Arlen planeswalks to Ravnica requesting the Gatewatch's assistance in locating the Moon Silver Key. She's joined by the Chronomancer Teferi, the Ghost Assassin Kaya, and the Pyromancer Chandra, and returns to Innistrad in a flash. Through their investigation, they learn of the Moon Silver Key's potential location in a landed family of Gavany's possession, the House of Betzold. Their journey takes them through the zombie infested streets of Thraben. The once glistening bastion of humanity on Innistrad is now suffused with rot and decay. Remnants of Liliana Vess's magic and the battle against Emrakul. They travel through the haunted moorlands beyond Nearheath, where Kaya exercises the spirits lingering within House Betzold. And their search finally bears fruit within the blasted ruins of Markov Manor. After many generations, the family agreed to pass the Moon Silver Key onto Soren Markov for safekeeping, where it has remained for many decades. Arlen whispers a prayer to what angels remain upon witnessing the gruesome scene within the estate walls, the terrible aftermath of Nahiri's feud with Soren. The vampire had freed himself from Nahiri's prison, and after the War of the Spark on Ravnica, returned once more to his homeworld. Agonized and withdrawn, he spends his days isolated in his family's destitute manor. Arlen and the Gatewatch warily approach Soren who sits dejected in the ruins of his family's throne room. They try to reason with him, but Markov is beyond rational thought. He sacrificed centuries of time and energy to keep Innistrad from slinking into darkness. He sacrificed his own creation, and he sacrificed his own family. Soren refuses to hand them the Moon Silver Key, and as he's about to strike against the Planeswalkers, Sigarda, host of Herons, and valiant protector of humanity, burst through the windows. Arlen's prayer from before was heard, and Sigarda confronts Markov. As the angel and vampire come to blows, the Gatewatch reach the resting place of the Moon Silver Key, and hurry back to Catilda to bring the ritual and awaken the Celestis. But restoration of day doesn't come easy, for the Harvest Tide Festival is infiltrated and attacked by Tovalar and his Dire Strand Halpak. This is related to us in cards like Harvest Tide Infiltrator and Storm the Festival, where we see the werewolves in a frenzied attack. The ritual mustn't be interrupted, so Arlen and the Gatewatch lead festival goers in the defense of the Celestis. In the heat of fighting, Tovalar and Arlen seek each other out in a duel for dominance. Kord believes that if she can strike the Alpha down, the rest of the pack will retreat. Their fight is bitter and terribly personal, but Arlen gains the advantage and defeats the Midnight Scourge. Wounded and battered, the Gatewatch is successful in protecting Catilda, but as she brings her incantation to its height and releases her spirit as sacrifice, a flash in the night sky and a flurry of movement descends upon the Dawnheart Prime. Olivia Voldaren, matriarch of the Voldaren bloodline and lord of Innistrad, whisks Catilda's body away. Desiring the Moon Silver Key for reasons known only to her, the vampire offers a trade, the witch for the artifact. Arlen sees few other options and grudgingly agrees, relinquishing the key to Olivia. Without the artifact, the ritual can't be fulfilled and the Celestis remains dormant. Unending night is poised to rise victorious, but as Olivia Voldaren plans an elaborate play for dominance over all of Innistrad, Using the Moon Silver Key, so too do the Gatewatch deliberate on how best to retrieve it before it's too late. Darkness reigns supreme in the aftermath of the Harvest Tide Massacre, with the balance ever shifting towards eternal night. The vampire families of Stensia have risen to power, no longer hunted by flights of angels or blessed Cathars, and enact a Blood Tide tribute on their human populations. They demand blood in exchange for protection, assurance that those who pay will not end up hunted and drained of blood completely. We see this in cards like Blood Tithe Harvester and Blood Tithe Collector, 
where vampires gather the offerings made by their human flock. It's a grim reality for humanity, and one the Gatewatch must determine how to reverse. If they can't continue the ritual Catilda began, Eternal Night will descend upon Innistrad and leave the plain barren, devoid of all life, not just that of humanity. The group once more travels to Markov Manor to learn from Soren what Olivia has planned with the Moonsilver Key. The family crypts beneath Markov Estate hold the coffins of all the elder vampires who've lived centuries or millennia. When they grow weary of the world, they slink into their coffins to rest for decades, rising sparingly to witness the change that has befallen Innistrad in their slumber. Soren approaches his grandfather's coffin. He occasionally revives the ancient vampire progenitor to seek guidance. But upon reaching Edgar's resting place, Soren finds the crypt empty, highlighted in the art and flavor text of Fateful Absence, where Olivia Voldaren has infiltrated and absconded with Edgar's crypt. A moment later, a courier bat delivers a letter from the matriarch herself. It's an invitation to witness the marital union of Olivia and Edgar Markov. Purely political, this would unite the two most influential bloodlines and fuel Olivia's desire to rule all of Innistrad. The Gatewatch arrive and ask for Soren's assistance in thwarting Voldaren's plans. The time for brooding has ended. Olivia continues to make her strikes against Soren deeply personal, and he's finally stirred from his depressive inaction. Soren must stop the wedding, stop the darkness, so that Innistrad may endure. Olivia's wedding celebrations includes all the decadence, wanton excess, and rivers of blood hallmark of a vampiric gala. Members of all bloodlines are present, and their gaudy hedonism is on display in several cards throughout the set. But just beyond the estate's walls and magical barriers, the Gatewatch prepares an assault team of Cathars and crack commandos to strike. Unfortunately, only those with an invitation can pass the barriers unharmed so Soren enters Lernbraum alone, promising that he will somehow lower the defenses. The Planeswalker is greeted by indifference or contempt from most of the vampiric partygoers, but Olivia is ecstatic that her most honored guest is finally here. Soren sees his grandfather's coffin resting on a mount just beyond the illustrious bride. He knows what Olivia has planned and in a fit of rage tries to strike her and save his grandfather. Soren is surrounded by dozens of house guards and shackled in chains, forced to bear witness to Olivia's resuscitation of Edgar Markov. A vampire requires blood to be awoken from slumber, and the thoughts, desires, and beliefs of the donor mingle with those of the recipient. Olivia uses her powerful blood to revive Edgar and entrance him, binding the vampire to her will. This is given to us in the art of the card, Edgar's Awakening. Enthralled by the Voldaren matriarch, Edgar doesn't resist the wedding proposition to unite the two households and grant Olivia supreme political power. But politics aren't the sole reason for her revival of Edgar. Olivia plans to use his ancient knowledge of dark blood magic to complete a ritual granting her power over the angels of Innistrad. For such a feat, she needs the blood of an angel, an echo of the requirements on that fateful day thousands of years ago when the first vampires were born. Olivia reveals that she already has an angel in her custody, perhaps the strongest remaining on the plane. The art of the card Sigarda's imprisonment shows that Voldaren captures and binds the wounded archangel, intent on using her blood to perform the ritual and gain control over the angels of the plane. For such a spell, Olivia uses the mystical Moonsilver Key as a bowl, a vessel to contain Sagarda's blood. Before the wedding and ritual are complete, the bound Soren lashes out with Sangromancy to interrupt the proceedings. The Moonsilver Key falls to the ground, and from it the spirit of Catilda, Dawnheart Prime, is unleashed. The witch uses her immense powers to loosen the bonds holding Sagarda. The Archangel casts off her prison and is filled with anger and holy retribution. 
she looks down upon the gathered vampires and deems them all guilty. In a violent pulse of pure white mana, Sigarda shatters the windows of Lurum Brown and casts a rending volley of broken glass down on the vampires. This is seen in the art of the card Sigarda summons, where we see the archangel joined by her winged flight of herons. The force of her attack disintegrates the barrier around Olivia's fortress and allows the Gatewatch and Cathars to strike. Confusion and death fill Lurin Brown's halls as the planeswalkers and their human allies crash Olivia's wedding. Kaya calls upon the geists haunting the castle. Chandra and Teferi lead commandos and partisans. Soren faces off against his grandfather, and Arlen tracks down a fleeing Olivia that has in her possession the Moonsilver Key. Though the greater assault is successful, Soren is beaten by Edgar and a transformed Arlen is pierced through by Olivia, so nearly achieving her goal in retaking the Moonsilver Key. At the time of this recording, the final story is yet to be published on Wizards' website, but by using the remaining Story Spotlight cards, we can gather some insight into the resolution of Crimson Vow. The Archangel Sagarda calls upon her angelic flight to bolster the forces assaulting Olivia's fortress and turn the tide of battle. A bloodied and defeated Arlen might receive well-timed aid in the arrival of her familial wolf pack that had abandoned her during Tovalar's attack on the Celestis in Midnight Hunt. This can be seen in the art of the card and the festivities, where a snarling pack of wolves come crashing into the Voldaren ballroom. Arlen's victory over the vampiric matriarch means the acquisition of the Moonsilver Key. After Lurin Brown is securely in the hands of the forces of light, Arlen and the Gatewatch return to the grounds of the Harvest Tide Massacre, place the Moonsilver Key and Sun Gold Lock at the base of the Celestis, and wait for Catilda's spirit to complete the ritual. Powerful, ancient magic flows through the air, the cogs of the Celestis tremble, and the massive structure shakes off hundreds of years of rust and deterioration as the metal spheres shift. In the card, Catilda's Rising Dawn, we see the aftermath of the Dawnheart Prime spell. The Celestis is placed in a way to bring balance to day and night. A brilliant flash of energy sweeps across the plane, and Catilda's own body is reunited with her spirit. The effects of the Celestis spell are filled immediately as the warm and glorious rays of dawn sear the night and once more bring day to Innistrad. We see this in the art of the card Glorious Sunrise, where Catilda, Arlen, and Teferi stand triumphant. Their purpose fulfilled. Humanity and the plane at large are saved from destruction in the clutches of eternal night. Though he's fallen from the graces of his grandfather, and twice over been cast out as a heretic by vampire kind. Soren can now rest easy knowing that Innistrad, his home in the plane he sacrificed so much for, is no longer on the brink of annihilation. The effects of Emrakul's presence in the moon have been reversed, and day is ascending. Hope is restored and faith is placed in the Archangel Sagarda, who along with her flight will continue to protect humanity from the dark. Arlen can at the same time embrace the freedom in which she is and pledge herself to a higher purpose. All around, Innistrad is recovering, licking its wounds and rebuilding itself. But although the Celestis ritual restored daylight, it didn't solve the underlying cause. The Eldrazi Titan Emrakul is still bound to the plane, tied to Innistrad, a fact that could have dire consequences for Innistrad and its people in the days to come. Thank you all so much for watching and listening to the complete history of Innistrad. Leave a thumbs up if you like the video, and if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, or if Magic the Gathering is dear to you, consider subscribing to the channel for frequent uploads. Now I want to hear from you. Which Innistrad set is your favorite? Which storylines capture your imagination? Which characters are you most passionate about? Please let me know as well as suggestions for future videos in the comments below. Again, a huge thanks to all my wonderful patrons who helped make these videos possible. 
I truly couldn't do it without their support. And if you're interested in joining our community and becoming a patron, check us out at patreon.com slash thelorebrarians, where you can gain access to me, get videos a day early, and help build the channel among other cool perks. Thanks to script editor Kenan Orhan and to Alex Joaquin for the intro and outro music. References can be found in the description. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.